Welcome to Jay Secular Live. This is Jordan Secular. So you know now President Trump is nominated uh, to be the next Associate Justice on the Supreme Court of the United Sta- States. Uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. He originally not nominated for that position about three and a half years ago. Uh, she formerly was a professor of law at Notre Dame. And again, this is someone who has a, a long academic background and, of course, has now got the judicial experience. Uh, so the Senate Judiciary Committee process is going to start October 12th. Senator Graham wants to wrap it up by October 22nd. There'll only be two days of questioning. In that meantime, she'll be meeting with senators, and the attacks will you know, uh, heat up. Some Democrats are saying they won't meet with her at all. I say that's great because they were so nasty to her the first time. Right. Diane Feinstein is nearly 90 years old. She is the ranking Democrat, so she's the highest-ranking Democrat. I think they're very, they have said they're very nervous about having her be the one in charge on the Judiciary Committee. So there is some talk that they may not go at all to the hearings, which I think would be wonderful Boycott. for Judge Barrett. Yeah, Please do it yeah. uh, because uh, we don't need your votes and we don't need your uh, just harassment of the next uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, she, again, I think what what for all of you out there who want to know more about her judicial philosophy, we're going to bring Harry Hutchinson on to talk about that later in the broadcast. But as she said, I clerk for Justice Scalia and his judicial philosophy is my judicial philosophy. That is exactly the kind of nominee yep. President Trump has been looking for is in the mold of, of the late Justice Antonin Scalia, people like uh, Justice Alito. These are these are true originalists to, to the Constitution. Right. Uh, Judge Barrett has authored 94 opinions uh, since she's gone on the bench. She clerked, uh, in addition to clerking for uh, Associate Justice Antonin Scalia, the late great Justice Scalia, she also clerked for the former chief judge of the D.C. Court of Appeals, Judge Lawrence Silverman. So she has really sterling credentials in that regard. She's well-respected. During her clerkship, she obviously worked with you come in as a year, basically. And in that year, uh, everybody that worked with her, including people in Justice Ginsburg's chambers, the law clerks there, wrote a previous letter saying she's eminently well-qualified, one of the smartest people that uh, they've ever met, and that she will do a, a fair, honest, and great job as a... Supreme Court justice, even though they don't agree with the position she was advocating. So I think this bodes well. Look, they're going to try the religious harassment. That's going to be the thing. When we come back from the break, I'm going to play you what Jeff Tubin from CNN said about that. I think what Tubin said is absolutely fascinating. Let me give you a little hint. You're going to go after her faith again? You did that last time. Didn't work out so well. Good luck with that. Those are going to be the words of Jeff Tubin. We'll be back with more in just a minute. Thanks to your support of the ACLJ, we have had many victories. The IRS now uh, formally apologizing to Tea Party groups. If any group feels like they're being targeted, they can go to federal court and bring our case. That's a victory. It's one of the most significant wins in the ACLJ's history, to take on the IRS and win. For more than 27 years, the ACLJ has been fighting for freedom and liberty in the United States and around the globe. These are are young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life at a whole new level to beat back the abortion juggernaut. But I actually think we're winning. This is one of the social issues we're winning. The release of Andrew Brunson. We're flying and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again. We need your help as we continue this work here in the United States and around the world. Join us online at the American Center for Law and Justice at ACLJ.org. So now, uh, you know, as we know and it's been confirmed, it will be Judge Amy uh, Coney Barrett uh, from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, who was the nominee uh, to fill the late Justice Ginsburg's seat on the Supreme Court. She, in her announcement speech, she said this about her judicial philosophy. I think this is key for everyone listening right now, because if you wonder about, like, where she comes uh, at looking at the Constitution, she made it really clear uh, and in this statement. I think this almost kind of says everything you need to know. I clerked for Justice Scalia more than 20 years ago, but the lessons I learned still resonate. His judicial philosophy is mine too. A judge must apply the law as written. Judges are not policymakers, and they must be resolute in setting aside any policy views they might hold. So, I mean, there you go. His judicial philosophy is mine, too. Harry Hutchison is joining us. We're going to talk about some of these nasty attacks on Judge Barrett, but first I want to talk the positive. 
for all the conservatives out there, they're very excited about this. You're seeing yep. widespread praise. The White House put out a document that had our statement in it. It had all of the senators' statements in it. It had all of the even House members and groups like ACLJ. So we're all listed in there with this praise. This is the kind of nominee that gets people excited uh, about uh, where their philosophy comes from, Harry. And by making the statement that about Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, that his judicial philosophy is my judicial philosophy, that is very telling because he has got a long time, uh, you know, he served on the circuit court and then in the U.S. Supreme Court. And as a clerk for him, she knows how to apply that philosophy as well. That statement should make conservatives very excited about Judge Barrett. I think you're absolutely correct. I think Judge Barrett brings to the court an originalist, textualist understanding of both the Constitution and the rule of law. She understands for the nation to remain together as a union that the rule of law must be enforced. Now, that approach is quite different from the approach favored by left-wingers. And if you look at specific decisions that Amy uh, Coney Barrett has reached, uh, particularly uh, in a gun rights case called Cantor versus Barr, also in a case uh, involving due process, uh, um, involving John Doe versus Purdue University, and thirdly, in a pro-life case, Planned Parenthood versus commissioners, she took the position that the Constitution uh, trumps policy analysis from judges. And certainly in the pro-life case, Planned Parenthood versus commissioner, uh, in that particular case, an evenly divided a vote of the Seventh Circuit denied Indiana's request that it review a three-judge panel's ruling that invalidated a state provision regulating the disposal of fetal remains. That lower uh, panel, or the, the three-judge panel, held that the Indiana law violated the Constitution. Uh, judge Amy Coney Barrett said no, and she dissented from the en banc panel and in a 7-2 ruling by the United States Supreme Court, a summary disposition judgment, a 7-2 ruling, Judge Barrett's analysis was upheld. In other words, Judge Barrett is saying you must treat fetal remains just like or at least as good as the remains of cats and gerbils. Okay. Is there any indication, Harry, I know a lot of people ask this on Roe versus Wade, where she stands on that, on, on those kind of issues. Do we have any, any, any pretty clear analysis from her? Well, I think the record is a little bare on that, but in about, I think it's three cases, she did at least touch on the analysis which might lead to a decision in Roe v. Wade, and she basically steered very close to the United States Constitution and to an originalist understanding of the text. And if you uh, look at the Constitution, there is nothing in the Constitution that says that abortion uh, is uh, controlled by the United States Constitution. So then I think it, this issue goes back to the states. Yeah, there, there's another thing here I think that's important, and that is the last time she was up, she was really attacked for her faith. I mean, they made the the Diane Feinstein and Dick Dubin. Let me uh, play the Durbin. Uh, let me play the uh, Diane Feinstein attack about her dogma. I think whatever a religion is, it has its own dogma. The law is totally different, and I think in in your case, uh, Professor. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern. The dogma lives loudly within you, which I think sounds like something out of Star Wars. But the fact that she even said that created a firestorm. In fact, CNN commentator Jeff Tubin said... You can thank Dianne Feinstein for your next Supreme Court justice, Amy Coney Barrett. Here's what he said, number eight. 
You know, one person who was not thanked during uh, the uh, during this ceremony was was one of the people who was most responsible for Amy Comey Barrett being uh, nominated to the Supreme Court, and that's Senator Dianne Feinstein, who in 2017, when uh, she was the ranking Democrat on the committee, engaged in questioning of of now Judge Barrett that was so incompetent, so inept, so apparently religiously discriminatory. Discriminatory, that Amy Coney Barrett became a hero to religious conservatives. Yeah. So there you go. So that was that line of questioning created this entire problem. Now, to complicate it more, and I think good for Amy Barrett, I think she's going to be confirmed. And I don't think she will be confirmed. She will be seated before the, the election, and we will have a full nine panel, full Supreme Court in place for what is likely to be multiple cases that will be involved in at the Supreme Court of the United States. But Tubin went on to say, this is again, focusing on Feinstein, who is the leader of the opposition here yeah, she's to her. She's member. the, the, the Democratic uh, uh, ranking member of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. Here's also what he said about the um, a continued attacks on her faith, number nine. Dianne Feinstein was and is a distinguished public servant who has served for many years on the Supreme Court. She is now 87 years old, and she has repeatedly engaged in behavior in recent months that seem out of step with uh, what Democrats want to do. And, you know, she is going to be the leader of the Democratic forces uh, on the Judiciary Committee. And all I can say is good luck with that, Democrats. I don't want to say much more than that. No, I th listen, they are burying themselves. They already have buried themselves. Like he, like uh, Tubin said and admitted that because they made her a name amongst conservatives. She, remember, she came out of ac the academic world. So she wasn't. She was made a judge by President Trump to the Seventh Circuit. That hearing highlighted her. The dogma lives deeply within. You know that that has become a phrase. Conservatives understand that that means a key voting block to get them out to vote. These are these are the kind of notices they make that you're going to choose that person that came to attention because of Democrats' attacks. But that now they're attacking her for having adopted kids. So you have Ibrahim Kendi. He is a professor at, at BU. Uh, and he wrote the the now pretty famous book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, like a number one seller on, on Amazon uh, for the last year. Um, but he tweeted out some white uh, colonizers, quote, adopted black children. They, quote, civilized these, quote, savage children in the, quote, superior ways of white people while using them as props in their lifelong pictures of denial while cutting the biological parents of these children out of the picture of humanity. That is uh, in response to Ginny Beth Martin from the Tea Party Patriots, friend of ours, who wrote that with two adopted children from Haiti, it's going to be interesting to watch Democrats try to smear Amy Coney Barrett as racist. Then we saw a professor, Harry, from BU, who wrote the How to Be an Anti-Racist book, do exactly that. How do we make her racist? She adopted black children from Haiti. She must be a white colonizer. Yes, it's highly ironic in terms of looking at Ibram uh, Kendi because he has written a book on how to fight racism. But in reality, if you think about his book carefully, if you read his book, if you read what the social justice warriors are actually saying, they believe in fighting racism through racism. And his statement attacking Amy Coney Barrett is quite frankly a racist statement and it's too bad that individuals like Kendi are able to further advance their own racism because they receive huge contributions from the left. Now, what's interesting is that he, he is getting like contributions from the left, but he looks like he's going to lose his job as a professor at BU, that this attack went too far and his comments have gone too far, too mm -hmm. radical, too almost too racist. He's becoming racist, and this rad and they're using this kind of rhetoric, not what they want from their university professors. So uh, even at you know, pretty, you know mainstream institutions, I don't know if it's say liberal, uh, but BU certainly has lots of liberal professors at it. Uh, he crossed the line on his attack. These are line crossing where people are losing their jobs in their response. They're losing their minds. But who is really to blame here? I think you know you look at Diane Feinstein. So you look at uh, the late Justice Ginsburg too, who did not resign under Obama under Obama when she was in her 80s, and it's had, it's been sick. She left it up to politics. You leave it up to chance then. This is what happens. We'll be back.
Thanks to your support of the ACLJ, we have had many victories. The IRS now uh, formally apologizing to Tea Party groups. If any group feels like they're being targeted, they can go to federal court and bring our case. That's a victory. It's one of the most significant wins in the ACLJ's history, to take on the IRS and win. For more than 27 years, the ACLJ has been fighting for freedom and liberty in the United States and around the globe. These are, are young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life at a whole new level to beat back the abortion juggernaut. But I actually think we're winning. This is one of the social issues we're winning. The release of Andrew Brunson. We're flying and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again. We need your help as we continue this work here in the United States and around the world. Join us online at the American Center for Law and Justice at aclj.org. The timeline is interesting, too. Uh, so uh, the hearings will start October 12th. You might say, well, that's kind of late if they want to get this done before uh, the, the election. But here's what they're thinking. And this would be, of course, Chairman Lindsey Graham. So they're going to have the hearings. So we'll start on October 12th. They will be done uh, uh, within 16 days or less. And that includes the one week uh, before they allow the, the markup. So basically hearings Tuesday and Wednesday. And on the 15th, they'll begin their markup. They'll hold it over to the 22nd. Then on the 22nd, it will go to Mitch McConnell. He could have the vote by the 26th, 27th, 28th. That means before the election, Judge Barrett, if Which all the important. people who are out, will be on the Supreme Court. We'll have full nine justices on the court before the election. So if any election issues Which is likely. reach. And it, yeah, and I, you know they focus a lot on the president, but there was an article over the weekend, at, I don't know if it was New York Times or Wall Street Journal, about, or maybe Politico, how the left is lawyering up and how even Nancy Pelosi is figuring out yes. the, the options on right now. See, the problem goes constitutionally. If you go to the House, the Democrats, even though they have the majority in the House, don't have the majority when it comes to the state delegations. It's 26 to 22. And there's two states that are that 26, are 26, uh, 24, I think right 26, now, right? 22, because Pennsylvania and Wisconsin are tied. That's right. So they would actually, if no changes there in the House, they would kind of uh, take themselves out. But there's also a legal question of whether it's the new House or whether it's the old oh, House yeah. and they have to do the but certification. But she's now saying we got to target our races based off of House races, based off getting back, you know, making up the deficit we have in the House, not which, by seats, but by states. Which means, this is what I, I think, that's why I think the Amy Barrett nomination, Jordan and Harry, I think is going to go pretty quickly. I think uh, there'll be rancor, but it's going to get right through and she will be seated uh, before the beginning of the first Monday in October. Now, having said that, I do think, and I mean, we would know this on a first-hand basis, there will be a series of cases that ultimately, on a very quick basis, will move to the Supreme Court of the United States on election issues. It may be electors. It may be the issue of uh, how ballots are verified, uh, absentee ballots are verified, or mail-in ballots are verified. It may be issues of harvesting. You're already seeing those um, develop in this. And in, in now there's a case out of, uh, we, we're keeping a very close eye on, out of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals involving South Carolina. There's a situation in North Carolina. Pennsylvania had the one just a few days ago. So there's a number of these cases that are developing. And look, there's significant constitutional issues with each and every one of them. So having nine members of the Supreme Court in place becomes very, very important as you move these issues forward. Now, having said that, let, let me tell you something. They're going to attack. Uh, I think they're going to have to stay away from her faith because they, that, as Jeff Tubin said, good luck with that. That didn't work out so uh, well. They're going to go back to it. They may. They may. They're and, putting uh, out tweets of her with a dog collar. So they're saying that RBG, you know, with her weird, weird yeah. lace collar, that's fine. You that know, was her they did, collar they, of the Yes, right. right. But they've yeah. Put, but for Amy Coney Barrett, they tweeted out you know the the meme that's going around the liberal world is a dog collar. And let me ask my husband. So uh, by the way, let me ask my husband. You gotta be it's just a joke, right? Like she she's the judge. Her husband's an attorney. Very successful. Uh, they have you know seven kids, two adopted. But who do you think is probably having to run a lot of the household there? The father. The, the, she the, said it. Yes, her husband. I mean, so this is it is a game they're trying to play. They only care about feminism and women succeeding if they're liberal women. Do you understand that? That's not feminism. 
That's anti-woman. That's anti-woman. That means you have to pick and choose what woman is okay to be ex- to to be excited about as a feminist. That's gross. That's disgusting. But that's the same thing on race. They're the racist. The liberals are the racist. The liberals are the ones who aren't actually feminist because they they judge people based off politics, not based off of qualifications or even the fact that you could say. Feminist should mean all women. If they're moving up to power, that's a good thing. Regardless if they're more conservative or liberal, they can't go there because they're so tied to ideology. They'll, they'll be racist. They'll be sexist. They'll be bigots like they have been with religion. So they've been all three of those. That is them. They'll call you those three names. But really, in reality, who are the racist? The liberal, the Democrats, Joe Biden. Who, uh, look at his time in, in office. I mean, he's, he's the worst. He's one of the worst offenders of all politicians. Who are the who are the uh, uh, sexist? Look at look at the uh, look at what the dog collar, for instance. Who are the bigots? Look at what Diane Feinstein did. All Democrats, not just liberal. Let me say it more specifically: Democrats are the racist, bigots, and sexist. Republicans have been fighting that for decades, uh, and it's not to say that Republicans are going to choose people because of that. She was just extremely qualified, and she became more high profile. Yep. Because of what Democrats did to her. So exactly. it's, it's it was twofold. She had the qualifications to be a Supreme Court justice. She does. And they they gave her a bigger profile, which is typically what attack. these... Yeah, people came to know her. She wasn't necessarily a D.C. insider like Kavanaugh. Yeah. She wasn't someone like Gorsuch who had maybe a decade of experience on the court. But because of her academic experience, her clerkships, uh, what people have said about her, uh, and then, of course, her time as a circuit court yeah. judge, and the attack on her, qualified. So I want it's Harry. This is a question I had for you, and that I have for you, and that is, on the legal issues, where are they going to go for the attack? Where, what's going to be the? Where are they going to say she's out of the mainstream of judicial thought, which is always their line? Well, I think one line of attack, which Joe Biden already highlighted, is to argue that she would invalidate the Affordable Health Care Act. She has written a law review article questioning. Uh, Judge Roberts' analysis, and I think a first-year law student could write a similar review of his analysis in the Affordable Care Act case because it was poorly written. It was doing poorly. That politically also, I mean, it's not just it's not just the cases. They're they're using that as political. Absolutely. Political so they are going to use that particular fear t- tactic. They are also going to attack her on grounds that she will necessarily overturn Roe v. Wade, and it's far from clear from her judicial record that she will necessarily, she may carve it back a bit uh, because she believes in originalism. But I think at the end of the day, because of Amy Coney, Coney Barrett's impeccable qualifications, and those qualifications, by the way, resonate with the American people, and because of her, ju- because her judicial philosophy is unimpeachable, And because even left-wing Harvard law professors like Noah uh, Feldman agree that she is brilliant, conscientious, and that she will analyze decisions in good faith, I think the left is essentially left with the following approach. Attack Judge uh, Coney Barrett largely on the basis of fictional claims, including either her affiliation with a Catholic group called People of Praise or the fact that she's adopted two children from Haiti. As a consequence, for instance, Newsweek magazine has published a highly fictional claim that Margaret Atwood's book, The Handmaid's Tale, is based on People of Praise. The left maintains this bogus charge despite the fact that the author of the book denies that she based her novel on uh, Amy Coney Coney Barrett's um, religious affiliation. So uh, there is no um, uh, factual basis uh, uh, to claim that Amy Coney Barrett and her husband uh, engaged, for instance, in an illegal adoption. But if you look at at the Twitterverse, uh, you will find plenty of claims uh, that there's something that demands an investigation. So I think... At the end of the day, this is a concession that uh, Judge Barrett is highly qualified. Every president in the past has at least nominated, including President Obama, and then it's up to the Senate. The Senate can or can't take the, the nomination. 
uh, what is it, 17 out of the 19 times the Senate and, and the, the president were the same party, Harry? 17 out of the 19 times, they not only, the, the president of, has always nominated when there's vacancy, and then 17 out of the 19 times when you know, both were Democrats or both were Republicans, uh, the nominee was confirmed in the election year. I think Sometimes that's correct. You have 35 I, days, 36 days out. I think the source of the discomfort for Democrats is the fact that, indeed, they have read the Constitution, but they are truly afraid of anyone who wants to enforce the text of the Constitution. Why? Because it limits their power. And that is clearly the case with respect to Amy Coney Barrett. She has read the Constitution very carefully, and it places clear and unmistakable limitations on both judges and on congressional power. Uh, it is clear also beyond question that the Democrats, when they have lost elections, they have looked to the Supreme Court to legislate on their behalf. And so Amy Coney Barrett is prepared to carve back those types of initiatives in the future. And so I think the Democrats are rightly afraid of her. I want you to listen to this. So large tribe, you know, a, a liberal law professor, Harvard law professor uh, on constitutional law. So he gets asked a direct question. He goes on Fox News Sunday. Let me go to by 27, though, because Britt Hume hosted Fox News Sunday yesterday, and he had Lawrence Tribe on, and here's the question. Speaking of the Constitution, sir, do you find any support for your argument in the Constitution itself? Oh, I'm not suggesting it's unconstitutional to go ahead. It's perfectly constitutional, but a lot of things that are constitutional are stupid. This is the point. So it's you got the right to do it, but you're stupid. You know, this is where Lawrence Tribe has has come to now calling people stupid for doing things that are illegal. Absolutely. So what you have is Lawrence Tribe, an elitist, a globalized uh, member of the elite hierarchy, who believes that his wisdom is superior to the wisdom of the founders, to the individuals who actually wrote the Constitution and ratified the Constitution. No one has elected Lawrence Tribe King, and I think the American people are much better off because he doesn't control the United States Constitution and he doesn't control um, the, the uh, nation as he might like to do.